This edict identifies Jesus of Nazareth as a heretic and a blasphemer. This season on The Chosen. There are those for whom this will set off a series of events. My followers won't understand. Lazarus, come out! I guess you're not holding back anymore. I can't. I'm out of time. See season four of The Chosen in theaters on February 1st, starting with episodes one, two, and three. Get your tickets now at thechosenriseup.com. Good day, Prakaptan, or good evening, if that's more appropriate. Today, we're going through Meditations 515 from Marcus Aurelius. But before we get started, I'd like to ask you to leave a review of this podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify Podcasts. And if you don't listen on either of those, you can use podchaser.com to leave a written review and let people know what you think of practical stoicism. Reviews help first-time might-be listeners turn into listeners, because as much as we all wish it weren't true, we do judge books by their covers, and our star rating is something like a cover for this podcast. So help us make it look pretty, and leave us a review when you get a moment. Maybe even today. Maybe even right now before I continue. Either way, thank you. Okay, here it is, Meditation 515. None of these things ought to be called a man's, which do not belong to a man, as man. They are not required of a man, nor does man's nature promise them, nor are they the means of any man's nature attaining its end. Neither, then, does the end of man lie in these things, nor yet that which aids to the accomplishment of this end, and that which aids towards this end is that which is good. Besides, if any of these things did belong to man, it would not be right for man to despise them and to set himself against them, nor would a man be worthy of praise who showed that he did not want these things, nor would he who stinted himself in any of them be good, if indeed these things were good. But now the more of these things a man deprives himself of, or of other things like them, or even when he is deprived of any of them, the more patiently he endures the loss. Just in the same degree, he is a better man. When I first read this, my head rolled onto the floor. I don't know why, but my ADHD made this particularly difficult to grasp. I had to read it six times. I don't want to assume you're as dim-witted as I am, but in case you are, I'm going to work through this meditation sentence by sentence so we do not miss anything of value. Ready? None of these things ought to be called a man's which do not belong to a man as a man. These things. What things is Marcus talking about? Throughout this entire meditation, we're referring to some things in a fairly vague manner from a contemporary perspective. Could you imagine if my fifth grade teacher asked me to choose a vacation spot to write an explanatory essay on, and the opening of my essay was, It was nice there. The place had trees, and I liked those trees. I heard they were native only to that place. I will never forget that place. For that place was the best place of all the places I've ever been. What place am I talking about? (laughs) I would get an F almost certainly and almost immediately. But since Marcus is writing to himself, he alone had to know what he meant. To be fair to him, for our purposes, and in this case, we actually know what he means. He means all those things that aren't within a man's nature. Wealth, for example, or poverty. These are not things which are natural to a man, in that they are constructed concepts, nor are they required of him attaining the only good, virtue. So he's not being vague, he's just being wordy, and it might make your head spin. Though he's just getting started, really. He continues, They are not required of a man, nor does man's nature promise them, nor are they the means of a man's nature attaining its end. As I just said, these things, these things which are not within the nature of a man, no matter what they are, are not required by men or women. Sorry, ladies, I'm only reading the text as it was. You are definitely included in this discussion. Stoicism is for all of us, if we want it to be nor are they in any way important to man achieving his ultimate aims, the only good, virtue. Again, back to the meditation. 
Neither then does the end of man lie within these things, nor yet that which aids to the accomplishment of this end. And that which aids toward this end is that which is good. So they aren't helpful to a man achieving the good, but they are also entirely unrelated to those things which are helpful to achieving such ends. In other words, wealth isn't just irrelevant, it's not even an ingredient in what is actually relevant. Imagine you're planning on summiting a small mountain. The thing that's going to help you do that, to achieve your ends, is your body, right? Your body is natural to you, as you are human and you have a body. What things might be unnatural in this case? Rope, boots, climbing gear, etc.? These things are not required to meet your ends, are they? You can climb a mountain naked while eating fruit you find along the way, could you not? Sure, hypothetically, I guess. I've never tried to do that, and I don't recommend you do either, but what about Everest? Surely you cannot summit Everest in not but your birthday suit armed with a few oranges, right? You'd need an oxygen tank, clothes to keep you warm, probably specific sorts of food rich in slow-burning carbs or something sciency sounding like that. Surely, if your ends were to climb Everest, you shouldn't just do it naturally. Should you? Could you? No, you couldn't, but I think that's the main point of Marcus's reflection here. When we move to do things that we cannot do without the aid of unnatural things, We are chasing a thing that is irrelevant to our achieving of the one thing which we believe to be good. Climbing Everest? Why? For pride? We don't need that. For recognition? We don't need that either. To raise money? We should be able to raise money without climbing Everest. What kind of silly people are we? If we have to do things we can't do only with things which are natural to a human, then we are doing a thing that no human is required to do in order to achieve the one good, again, virtue. Does that mean we shouldn't do super cool things like climb Mount Everest, generate great wealth, or shoot ourselves into space to explore the great unknown? No, it doesn't mean that at all. It just means none of that stuff actually matters in regards to attaining virtue. Again, back to the meditation. Besides, if any of these things did belong to a man, it would not be right for a man to despise them and set himself against them. Nor would a man be worthy of praise who showed that he did not want these things, nor would he who stinted himself in any of them be good, if indeed these things were good. We shouldn't despise anything, because if something is within our nature, we would be despising our own nature by despising it, which we shouldn't do as Stoics, or if something is not within our nature and therefore has nothing to do with the attainment of virtue, why would we despise it? It is an indifferent. Again, to the meditation, but now the more of these things a man deprives himself of, or of other things like them, or even when he is deprived of any of them, the more patiently he endures the loss, just in the same degree, he is a better man. So, in other words, the longer we reinforce the habit of not despising those things that are indifferent to our development of virtue, or not desiring those things that are indifferent to our development of virtue, the less and less we need to work to habituate such dispositions and the sooner we become entirely resistant to such feelings. Now, I can't recall if this is the first time we've heard Marcus say this, but it feels like the first time, at least, that we've heard him say it with such a mature countenance. In fact, now that I mention it, and maybe you've noticed it too, somewhere between the start of Book 5 and now, it seems that Marcus has become more informed of Stoicism. Perhaps he's taken on a tutor. Not sure if there's anything to that impression, but I'd be interested in knowing how far apart Book 4 and 5 were written. Anyway, here's your homework. Identify two things you despise the idea of then write down how that disdain negatively impacts your daily experience. Do the same thing for two things you desire or lust after. How do those desires negatively impact your life? 
Let me know what you come up with in the episode follow-up channel of our Discord community. There's a link to join that if you're not already a member, which, by the way, is free, in the show notes of this episode and every episode we've ever released. That is all I've got for you. I hope you enjoyed today's episode, and until next time, take care. Thank you.